Deep listening. Fakarongo Hohonu. Deep listening. Deep listening. Al Estima Al Amiq. L'écoute profonde. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. He took a long pause and then um, he says, Ah, so culture is like the fire. It is lights the way, it warms the heart, and it uh, keeps at bay the unwanted. And to this day, I don't think I've ever heard a better description in some respects of what culture is actually all about. Welcome to Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. In this episode, we have the opportunity to speak to corporate anthropologist Michael Henderson. We get to explore the jungles of Africa and South America and the jungles that are the boardrooms inside Australia, New Zealand and the Western world. Michael brings a perspective of listening to cultures. I love the way he talks to the role of engagement surveys and the fact that they're probably wasted money if the surveys aren't designed by the very people who are filling them in. Listen carefully how he teaches us from the Pygmy people the three key elements of building a powerful culture. And listen carefully as you hear the wood crackling in the campfire where Michael's talking to the chief. Let's listen to Michael. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Escuta profunda. A horrendous amount of money gets invested in these things called engagement surveys and listening tours. Could you talk through the difference between listening and being heard at a systemic level for all employees and what they can learn from ancient cultures? Yeah, so th- th- the big difference, and I couldn't agree with you more, is you've kind of uh, hit on one of my hobby horses, is um, um, I've got a real concern about um, how organisations are using engagement surveys and often surveys in general. There's nothing wrong with surveys per se, but I think you need to be very, very aware of the context in which the questions are being asked. For example, uh, if you sit around a fire in a traditional culture, the questions that are used um, around that fire to entertain or to inform or to educate or simply just to connect and share are always contextual, so the people um, who are asking the questions are in the culture already, and so they are often um, able to select even the right phrasing of the question to elicit the response that they're looking for. Whereas you find with the organisational surveys and engagement surveys, the questions are usually generic, not customised, They're used to design to measure in comparison to other cultures, which anthropologically speaking is bordering on insane um, because you you can't compare one culture with another in terms of metrics. So it seems sort of, it seems really bizarre process to go through. So, So what actually ends up happening is I think the surveys are question biased rather than listening optimized. Um, So what I mean by that is there's far more emphasis placed on defending or justifying the questions that are being asked rather than actually really listening to the answers. Um, So let me give you a very practical kind of example of that. One of the things I've noticed, (laughs) this happens fairly recently at a conference I was speaking at, uh, the HR manager went on stage just um, sort of 15 minutes before I was speaking and just sort of said, look, everybody, I just want to remind you, and this was a fairly large audience, sort of um, eight or 900 people, Uh, So the HR manager said, I just want to remind you all that we've got the engagement survey coming out next Thursday. It's really, really important that you all complete the survey so we get an up-to-date picture of how you're all feeling about the business and we get a comparison to uh, how we were last year and also how we're comparing in the industry. You know, so just reminding you all to do that and walked off stage. Because I was sitting uh, off off, off stage to the sort of stage right, I was able to watch the audience response to her reminder about the engagement survey. And what was fascinating was, uh, and I hope I'm not exaggerating here, I would say over half of the audience rolled their eyes or gave some sort of facial expression that was less than enthusiastic or demonstrating less, um, less than sort of full commitment and passion to do the survey. 
And so I thought, well, there you are. You've just you've got your survey straight in front of you. About 50% of the audience has just demonstrated they're disengaged by the word engagement survey. So the big thing about the difference between a tribal setting or traditional cultural setting, and to be honest, it doesn't even need to be a traditional tribal, it can be your own family, is that engagement surveys are in the moment. So they're occurring in constant dialogue, and if you're listening uh, to people's expressions and their metaphors and their analogies, they're actually telling you right here and right now what whether they're engaged or not, and, and more particularly, what are they engaged about? So my, my final piece on this is I think the world's best engagement survey would be designed by the employees themselves. So I think you know empowering people to ask and design and develop the questions that they want to be asked about the culture would be far more empowering, useful, and provide a far deeper listening for the organisation itself to hear what's really on people's minds rather than restricting it to what you've got in your questions to ask them. Asking people who are part of the culture to design their own surveys. What a great example of deep listening. So, Michael, you call yourself a corporate anthropologist, but where does that journey start? It starts with the anthropology usually before the corporate. Um, I'll just explain the two words separately. Corporate, obviously, is big business and it's many different forms. Anthropology is the study of human culture, and it's a fairly large field of social science that includes everything from musical anthropology to symbology uh, to belief and ritual. So it's a kind of a complex web of understanding and studying human culture. So when you put the two together, corporate anthropology is literally taking the skill sets or the perceptions and perspectives from anthropology and applying it into the business world to identify areas and opportunities where organizations can have a better sense of awareness or a better sense of anticipation or a better uh, opportunity to apply and inspire the workplace cultures that they're creating inside their organizations. So I've spent time in both Africa and South America um, observing and participating around uh, traditional cultures, but, but largely traditional cultures that were on the interface of corporate culture or tourism or uh, commercialism. So trying to see where traditional cultures were being impinged, threatened, or even just connected to uh, outside cultures and seeing what their response mechanism was. And that served me really, really well because it enabled me to start to prepare, although I didn't realize that was what would be coming decades later, but it enabled me to start to really understand uh, what is very popular in the marketplace at the moment is this whole concern around organizations talking about disruption in the marketplace. Have you got a really powerful example from South America or Africa that kind of stands out for you back 30 years ago? Yeah, there's one one story I tell a lot. Um, was I was very privileged. Had some time with the Twa people, who you probably know better as the pygmy in Uganda, in Central Africa, in the jungle, um, and had the opportunity to sit, be invited to sit around the fire one night, which I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, but it's a, a great privilege to be invited to sit next to the chief around the fire. It's just you and him at a sort of separate fire, and everyone else gathers at another fire. And he just talked around uh, my work and what I was doing because he was really curious and interested in uh, why I was even here and why I was interested in the tribe, et cetera. And between the two of us, we were attempting to find a common understanding of this kind of concept of culture, which is key to my work. And yet in their world, they didn't really kind of have a word that even uh, captured the essence of culture. They just talked about it as the people so the people do this and the people are this and the people tell this story. And so after sort of a little bit of toing and froing, trying to um, clarify between the two of us what we, what we meant by culture, he took a long pause and then um, he says, ah, so culture is like the fire. It is lights the way, it warms the heart, and it uh, keeps at bay the unwanted. And to this day, I don't think I've ever heard a better description in some respects of what culture is actually all about. And I still use that reference point today in, in the work I'm doing in modern organizations going, you know, what is your culture doing to light the way and 
to what extent is it a beacon in the dark to attract others to it, be it uh, employees or customers? And also, you know, how, how is your culture signaling to the marketplace that you want certain people to stay away? So I still, I still use that reference today, and that's, you know, from 30 plus years ago. Um, so I just think it's a really powerful uh, analogy or metaphor just to kind of keep things very, very simple and look at what the role of culture potentially is doing inside organizations. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. It's quite timeless. I'm curious about the role of three things in that, and, and it's actually because there are three. Um, for, for those in the audience, why is it always so much easier to remember just three things? Because that's kind of transcultural, isn't it? Uh, yes and no. It depends. Uh, I think in the Western cultures, we have a fascination with three because we're predominantly binary in so much of what we uh, do in our lives. So most of the Western education system that um, people may have gone through um, it comes out of the Greek perspective of life, which is uh, logical. So the Greeks invented logic and fell in love with logic. Um, uh, but logic is almost a limitation in some respects it's incredibly useful of course so you can be kind of rational and sequential and feel that you're making very informed and wise decisions and at the same time it's still a binary kind of operating system and so what that means is you're fundamentally dividing the world up into right and wrong ethical and unethical profitable and unprofitable productive and unproductive um, promoted and not promoted um, sold or not sold bought or not bought and so and so forth so i think the appeal of the three component element is very attractive to Western uh, cultures because it's reminding us that there's probably a little bit more going on than just what we think about and how we're perceiving things. So that third element is an open um, space, an open opportunity to play in. And even in the topic that you're uh, masterful around, it's deep listening. If you think about talking and listening as we're both doing this dialogue now the word that i'm most impressed with um, in the work that you're doing is not so much the listening but the deep and so that deep is a third component because i'm sure most of your listeners would agree we spend an awful lot of time in dialogue either talking to or talking at or talking with and also hearing and listening so we're hearing sounds and maybe we're even listening to those sounds so sort of putting more attention on that but we're not necessarily unpacking it and going deep. We're not necessarily reading between the lines or really understanding not what's said, but more what is meant by what is said. So I think there's this um, almost this seduction of the third element that you've uh, brought all our attention to here. So Michael, as you dance between ancient cultures, Eastern cultures, Western cultures, and then in stepping into corporate cultures, Listening to context highlights patterns. How do you listen to the context when you go into corporations? A lot of it is um, really tuning into the adjectives that somebody is using. Um, so the adjectives are almost like road signs in terms of which direction the person is coming from or which direction the person is attempting to go to. Mm. And um, by listening to those repeatedly, you can get a sense of uh, potentially the, the worldview, which is sort of an anthropological term, but the, the perspective, I guess, is the other way of saying it. Mm. Uh, another element is listening to whether someone feels empowered by what they're saying or disempowered. So again, by listening very carefully to the language and listening for repeated patterns and depending on what you're there for and what the dialogue is focused on, you can either bring that to their awareness and see if that's uh, a valid way of describing the circumstances or the experience they've had. Uh, and sometimes it is you know, very, uh, very valid and they're very aware of what they're saying. Michael, it was a joy to learn from you. And more importantly, there was about oh, nine things that I was furiously scribbling down that I know the audience is going to love. Michael, thanks so much. My pleasure, Oscar. Thank you. Deep listening. Deep listening. Escuchando profondamente. L'écoute profonde. Exploring your role and your 
judgment. And what you bring to the conversation and the dialogue was beautifully illustrated by Michael where he talked about how he fits in to cultures when he comes to listen. I love the way he explored context through patterns, particularly through language patterns and adjectives, and how conscious you are when you're noticing other people speaking. I wonder if you really listen at that level, because if you do, you can unpick some amazing power in the conversation, not just for you, but for the person you're speaking with, the person you're listening to. Ultimately, Michael role model beautifully how important making meaning is from any conversation and it's in understanding where meaning is at level five that the power comes about in a conversation. A great warning for corporate leaders out there, don't go through the motions with engagement surveys. Engagement is built in every moment, it's in every conversation. Look carefully at the body language that the people you're talking with are giving back to you. That'll tell you better than any survey you'll ever create how engaged they are. Thanks for listening. Deep listening. Fathia Akrasi. Deep listening. Gush dadane Amir. Kipun Tsitki. Deep listening. Kuuntele syvällisesti. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.